Thank you very much. Um, and it's, it's great to be speaking here as, as a part of the day focusing on inequalities in Greater Manchester. Um, I don't know how many of you know Centre for Cities. We're a research organisation based in London. Um, we're a not-for-profit organisation whose charitable remit is to support economic growth and development in UK cities. In my presentation today, I want to focus on uh, inequality in cities and how Manchester compares to other cities in the UK before going on to, to kind of look at some of the drivers of inequality in cities and what cities themselves can actually do um, to improve access to economic opportunity and reduce inequality. Um, I should say, obviously, there are, there are lots of different ways of looking at inequality, as we've seen from this morning's presentations. My focus is very much on economic inequality and how that relates to uh, employment opportunity. So I should just warn you, there aren't very many cheery slides in my presentation. Apologies. Um, so first off, how does Greater Manchester compare when we look at earnings? So uh, this chart here looks at um, uh, average earnings um, uh, at 20% uh, from the bottom of the earnings distribution compared to 10% from the top of the earnings distribution. So similar to some of the um, measures that John was using, the kind of 10 to 90 uh, ratios. And we can see that actually on earnings inequality, that I should highlight this isn't income inequality, but on earnings inequality, Manchester has a kind of similar level of, of inequality compared to some of the other big cities um, in uh, the UK, such as Leeds and Greater Birmingham, and actually has, as you might expect, lower levels of earning inequality than um, London. But of course, as I said, that's quite a narrow measure of, of inequality. Um, if we take a slightly uh, wider measure and uh, look at how Manchester compares across the index of multiple deprivation, which obviously looks at not just income, employment, but also education, housing, health, and disability, um, we can see that actually um, there are relatively high levels of, of inequality in Manchester. So these two charts just plot the percentage of neighbourhoods that fall within the 20% uh, least deprived neighbourhoods in the country. So you can see that around 6% of neighbourhoods in Manchester fall within these, these six, this 20% least deprived. And at the other end of the spectrum, in terms of the most deprived neighbourhoods, um, around 23% of neighbourhoods in Manchester fall into, uh, I, I said top 20% tw uh, but it's actually top 10% most deprived neighbourhoods in the country. And this means that actually when you're comparing Manchester against other cities, um, there are kind of high levels of, of inequality in, in the city. So, uh, in terms of the levels of deprivation in Manchester, um, uh, in the city's, mo in the city's uh, top 10% most deprived neighbourhoods, um, the kind of score on the IMD is around 8.4 times higher uh, than neighbourhoods in the least deprived 10%. And that compares to around 7 0.6 times in, in London and 6.6 times in Birmingham. So because you've got some very highly deprived neighbourhoods in Manchester, it actually means that you've got quite high levels of, of inequality compared to other cities um, in the UK. I should just mention that when we talk about um, Manchester um, from the Centre for Cities perspective, we're looking at... Um, uh, Bury, Manchester, Oldham, Stockport, Salford, Thameside and Trafford. So it's a slightly different definition to Greater Manchester. That's the kind of picture on inequality. But what's, what drives inequality in cities? 
um, in terms of uh, kind of access to employment and earnings opportunities? Well, we know that skills inequality and human capital has an impact uh, on social inequality. Uh, this chart here just looks at, uh, compares the proportion of residents in cities with no qualifications against those with graduate level qualifications. Um, and Manchester's uh, highlighted in the middle there. You can see that around 34% of residents have uh, graduate level qualifications. So Manchester ranks quite highly on, on that score. But it also has uh, around 11% of, of residents with no qualifications, which obviously has an impact on access to employment opportunities. And there, more generally, there is a strong correlation between skills and unemployment, and in general with areas with um, kind of low-level qualifications have tended to be hit hardest during the recession and um, are not recovering as well um, uh, since. Um, and that links to um, some of the issues around educational attainment. Um, of course, when you look across the country at uh, GCSE attainment, we can see that there are quite large disparities between cities when it comes to the proportion of, of young people getting five good GCSEs, including English and maths. But when we're looking at inequalities within cities, um, one of the most concerning things is the gap between disadvantaged pupils and their peers. And of course, across the majority of cities, uh, that gap is really quite large. So on this side, uh, what's plotted is uh, the, um, the gap between GCSE attainment rates for the most disadvantaged pupils and their peers. So you can see in places like York, there's a 40% percentage point gap in attainment rates. Um, uh, in Manchester, there's a 30 percentage point uh, gap. So uh, whilst um, uh, kind of other, other pupils would, around 66% of them would get five good GCSEs, um, amongst disadvantaged pupils, this drops down to around 37%. So there's a huge gap in uh, attainment, education attainment rates. And Ruth was talking about um, that earlier. It, 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 it starts, these kind of gaps start early and they tend to widen over the course of um, education. London is a city that stands out on the right hand side of this chart as having actually a much smaller gap in attainment rates um, compared to other cities. Um, and pupils, uh, disadvantaged pupils in London tend to do a lot better than disadvantaged pupils elsewhere. We still haven't got to the bottom of, of why exactly there is that is. Um, a lot of people have previously talked about the London challenge and the impact that that's had. Um, but research since that has actually said uh, it was more to do with what's happened at, at primary schools. But of course, skills, education have a big impact on, on people's um, employment opportunities. But it's only part of the story. Um, because clearly the demand side of the d equation matters too. Um, this uh, chart just looks at essentially um, uh, plots um, levels of overqualification um, uh, amongst businesses uh, in relation to uh, the skills gaps and skills shortages. Um, and kind of the, essentially the proportion of staff with who are overqualified are uh, mapped out here in, in blue. And I think as you, hopefully you can see, um, this is much more of a significant issue across all of our cities. So, you know, whilst there are some significant skills shortages and skills gaps, actually in the majority of cities, uh, more, more people are actually overqualified for their, for their jobs. So we know that actually our skills matter, it's actually how skills are used in the labour market that, that really matters. 
And that links to the changes that we've, we've been seeing in urban labour markets. And so this chart comes from some work that we did last year um, with JRF, looking at the changing uh, nature of jobs in, in um, UK cities. And uh, the labour market in all of our cities is, is polarising. So essentially, we're seeing quite significant falls in those kind of middle income jobs, um, whilst seeing a shift towards, at, at either end, high pay jobs and low pay jobs. Um, and, and Manchester's labour market is, is one of those kind of highlighted in green where you are seeing quite a high degree of polarisation uh, taking place um, in, in the labour market. And that's, that's a, a concern for several reasons, um, partly because it will impact on, on pay, um, partly because it will impact on job security, but also on, on progression. So, in particular, the shift towards low-pay occupations away from intermediate occupations really risks more people actually being either trapped in low-pay jobs or actually being pushed further away from the labour market. But this is a trend um, that we've seen over the kind of kind of past. Um, kind of this this chart looks at 2010 to 2011. Um, but a trend that we've seen across every city. And of course, the changes in, in the labour market, as I've said, are likely to impact on, on pay. There is some evidence, although not enough, at the city level that wages are polarising as well as, as, as jobs. Um, uh, but we really need, in terms of pay, a much better understanding of how the cost of living in cities impacts on people's real pay. And that's been talked about a bit this morning, um, but uh, particularly um, kind of uh, striking from our research is that in terms of pay, there's much more variation at the higher end than the lower end, which means in, in high cost cities where housing is kind of most unaffordable, actually real pay for lower income groups is likely, likely to be a lot lower. This map uh, looks at levels of job security. Um, so this is um, from data, um, using data from the Understanding Society uh, survey, which looks at the proportion of people that remained in essentially continuous employment between 2009 and 2012. Um, so the, the cities highlighted in red and orange had lower proportions of people remaining in employment during that time. And hopefully you can see that those levels tend to be lower in cities in the northwest. And uh, in Manchester, less than half of people remained in continuous employment during that time. I mentioned about progression. Um, one of the obvious concerns about what's happening in terms of the polarisation of the labour market is the impact on people's ability to climb the, the career ladder and progress in work. Um, this is one of the areas where I think we've probably got the least amount of, of, of evidence. Um, our study with um, JRF uh, looked at what's happening in the um, uh, core cities. Um, we had to restrict it to the core cities due to sample sizes. Um, but it looked at the percentage of workers that are progressing onto higher paid occupations between 2009 and 2012. Um, and essentially, uh, it corroborates um, evidence from the LSC that essentially says that you tend to have more progression in London. So there's a stronger escalator. Birmingham, for some reason, we're not quite sure why, ranks up above um, London. Um, but the two of them are, are higher than, than uh, Manchester. Um, I've put this map of the US on this slide. Um, this is uh, a map from a study by uh, Raj Chetty, a Harvard economist, um, where they used uh, over 40 million observations to look at how social mobility rates compare across the US. Um, I think the kind of nearest comparable study in the UK, which was done at national level, used kind of several thousand observations. Um, 
But what's clear is that levels of, of spatial mobility really do vary across place. And we don't, at the moment, have a, a good enough understanding of how social mobility um, actually varies across our cities and, and local areas. Um, because, you know, at the moment, we're quite often looking at this, the static um, picture. They've actually now managed to, uh, to use this data and make a causal link between social mobility and school performance, and in particular, teacher quality, um, which is, you know, quite remarkable and um, a long way from, from where we currently are in terms of understanding how social mobility, occupational mobility, operates across the country. Um, so what can cities do to improve access to opportunity and reduce inequality? Um, I talked about the importance of kind of education and skills, but clearly that, that, that's only part of the story. Um, you know, cities uh, should be looking to intervene on, on the supply side, whether it be kind of education and training policies, um, kind of looking at minimum wage, uh, living wages. Um, there's been more debate more recently around introducing a minimum wage in, in London and whether that's appropriate. Um, but clearly there's a huge amount of work to be done on the demand side, given um, what's happening in the, in the labour market. Um, from workforce development, and I think there's potentially something interesting that could be looked at in, in the care sector, because um, obviously that's one of our biggest low-paying sectors in the UK. Um, real wages fell significantly over the course of the recession in that sector. Um, uh, so there's perhaps something to be done around kind of pay and workforce development in that sector. Um, career ladder development, there's lots of interesting work that's been done in the US and, and US cities um, where... Uh, large employers or anchor institutions such as hospitals, universities um, have, have essentially sought to improve the employment and progression opportunities for low-income um, residents. And of course this all needs to be linked to broader economic development interventions too to drive up um, demand, drive up job creation and, and create not just more jobs but, but better jobs. Um, on that, uh, just to touch on kind of a, like kind of the physical regeneration start side and estate um, renewal, um, I was in Hume um, a couple of months ago uh, with the OECD conference, and um, we were talking about all the, the regeneration that's happened around that area with um, kind of the former crescents being knocked down. And it's a big area of, of inner city um, redevelopment. Um, and clearly lots of professionals have moved into the area, but you've still got high levels of, of unemployment. Centre for Cities partners with the What Works Centre for Local Growth and did a big study on estate renewal. Um, and they found through the kind of impact evaluations that it does lead to increases in, in property and, and land prices, but it has a limited effect on employment and income. Um, and health, crime, and kind of other measures. And there are no impact evaluations that have actually isolated the effect for um, existing residents. Um, so I think very much when we're thinking about kind of physical regeneration initiatives, um, what initiatives like that do exist now, because um, regeneration isn't really a, a term that's, that's used, particularly in, in government circles now. Um, it's about how you join those initiatives up to skills and employment policy. Um, I think one of the most important things here is, is not just getting the right balance between the types of intervention, but also joining up across policy areas, because clearly you know, inequality, poverty, they, these are very, very complex issues. You're not going to solve it through kind of one, one policy intervention. And just lastly, um, uh, Centre for Cities have done a lot of work on, on uh, devolution, um, looking what's, uh, what's happened um, through uh, all of the city deals, local growth deals. Um, but very much the UK continues to be one of the most centralised countries in the UK. Just two um, illustrations here. 
um, around kind of uh, the fact that actually compared to other international uh, economies, the UK has limited finance, uh, local authorities and cities in, in the UK have limited financial autonomy. Um, and, uh, and where local partners are investing in schemes like the Troubled Families Initiative in Manchester, most of, you know, local partners invested around 67% of, of funds, um, but most of the savings accrued back to national government. Um, so clearly Manchester has led the way on kind of devolution, securing the most significant devolution deal in the country um, with kind of more powers across a range of areas. Um, but there's still more to be done in terms of actually allowing um, cities and local partners to in intervene in, in ways that are appropriate for their local economies, their local labour markets, and in ways that uh, respond to the needs of their local businesses and local communities. Um, but of course, devolution, I should say, isn't sufficient. Um, when you look at uh, the US, clearly there are much higher levels of, of uh, of inequality in their cities have a great deal more financial autonomy. Um, but without it, it's very difficult to get that join up across, across policy areas and really do something to improve people's access to employment opportunity. Okay, thank you very much.